Good morning, everyone. Please do come in and find a seat. We've got some seats up toward the front. Um, welcome to the Attitudes and Priorities for Neurodiversity Research Session. I am Dr. Alyssa Alcorn from the University of Edinburgh. I'll be chairing today. Um, I've been told if we hear any fire alarms or other alarms, it is a real alarm, not a test. So we will want to follow the exit signs out of the building. We've got four talks today. Um, each talk will be 10 minutes long, and then we will have 10 minutes for shared Q&A at the end. Um, we are going to try to ask questions using the app. I think the procedure, again, is you navigate to the list of sessions for Monday and click on this session. That's right, so isn't it? Yes. And there should be a button in there to ask a question. Please do come on in. We've got some seats up toward the front. I don't think any of our speakers bite, though I'm not completely sure. Um, so if you are unable to access the app to ask a question, we will have a microphone up here and you can come up, but we do wanna to try to use the app because of course we also have people joining us online. So I'm going to go ahead and invite our first speaker up to the stand. Thank you, welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Please come on in. Um, our first speaker is Rachel Schrock, who's joining us from University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and she will be speaking about development of a questionnaire to assess attitudes toward neurodiversity. So please welcome Rachel with your best flap laws. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Shuck. I'm a graduate student at UC Santa Barbara. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and as Dr. Alcorn said, I'm gonna be talking about the development of a questionnaire to assess attitudes toward neurodiversity. So I first wanna just introduce the research team. In addition to myself, um, the team consists of Caitlin Baden, Patrick Dwyer, Sunghee Choi, and Andrew Mall, um, some of whom are here today. Um, our team includes uh, doctoral students in both education and psychology, a professor of educational measurement, an autistic researcher, a researcher with an autistic child, and two researchers with current or former clinical, clinical experience, and we have no um, conflicts of interest to declare for this project. So I first wanna just give some background on this project. So UC Santa Barbara has a teacher education program, um, and they try to incorporate neurodiversity into their tr uh, teacher training program, particularly for teachers who are going to be working with students um, who are disabled. And a couple of years ago, a professor asked um, me and Sung Hee, fellow graduate student, to find a survey that assessed um, how well the program was teaching their students about neurodiversity. Um, she basically wanted to be able to give a survey at the beginning of the program, and then a year later, after the program, give a survey again to look for changes. And when we looked into the literature, we couldn't really find something that was super relevant or um, that adequately captured that. There were a lot of surveys that were about specific um, disabilities or specific diagnoses, such as autism, ADHD, intellectual disability, but there was nothing about neurodiversity as a whole. So we then set out to develop this kind of questionnaire. Um, and so this talk is really going to be about our process um, for doing so, for developing and validating such a questionnaire. So these are all of our steps. Um, these steps have similarities and some differences to the typical way um, questionnaires are usually designed in psychology. Um, so our first step was to carefully define our construct or our topic and our target user for the questionnaire. We then created initial survey items and got feedback. We then revised those questions. We then got even more feedback using a systematic process that I'll talk about a little bit later. We further revised the questions and then ultimately piloted the survey. So I first just wanna mention the, the first few um, steps in our process. So initially, Sung Hee and I designed a very preliminary survey that contained questions that were really targeted toward teachers. And most of the questions were about inclusive education practices and universal design for learning. And we showed those questions to some teachers and they basically were telling us that the items were kind of confusing, hard to answer. And so we regrouped at that point. And then it was at that point that we decided that really the construct we were most interested in looking at was attitudes toward neurodiversity. 
So we decided to use a tripart the tripartite model of attitudes um, for our development of our survey. So the tripart model of attitudes contains three attitudinal domains, which are affective or emotional, behavioral, and cognitive. And our reason for wanting to do this was because we were thinking that it was possible that people have attitudes um, kind of in different domains. You might, there might be a person who's uh, highly positive in an, the affective domain, but not as much in the behavioral domain. And this kind of goes along with um, what Sandra Jones said um, in her paper in 2022, that many existing attitude surveys, for example, surveys about um, attitudes toward autism, may categorize someone's overall attitude as positive, um, even if they admit to having certain aspects of negative attitudes within the questionnaire. Um, the example given is that um, for this particu uh, particular attitude, autism attitude questionnaire, you might be categorized as having an overall positive attitude toward autism, and yet if you look at the responses, somebody who's seemingly positive could have said something like they feel uncomfortable sitting next to an autistic person. Um, so we felt it was really important to try to capture multiple dimensions of attitudes. So these are some examples of um, the questions. So um, for the affective domain, something like I would feel uneasy if someone stopped a person from flapping their hands. For behavioral at work, I would be willing to take direction from or be supervised by a neuro neurodivergent person. And then for cognitive, there's no such thing as a normal brain. So we decided our target sample was helping professionals, so not just teachers, but doctors, therapists, anyone who would be supporting neurodivergent people. We then worked to create survey items. Um, all of the items were Likert scale with six answer choices from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And we initially showed these survey items to uh, three neurodivergent people and three researchers who had experience in inclusive education and measurement, and we got feedback from them, revised our items, and then we went on to get more systematic feedback. So the process um, that we used to get systematic feedback was called um, a response process evaluation. So during this process, each question in our survey was reviewed by 25 to 40 UCSB undergrads. We had 190 undergrads participate at this point, 11 identified as disabled and more likely identified as neurodivergent, but unfortunately we did not ask about neurodivergent identity um, at this stage of the, um, the project. So each participant was then asked what each item in the survey meant, what they thought it meant, and why they chose the answer that they did. Um, we wanted to do that to make sure that people were interpreting the questions in the way that we intended them to be and that people were using the same line of reasoning for cho choosing answer choices. We wanted to avoid having people um, have wildly different reasons for choosing an answer, but both, but they still choose agree. Um, and then also the opposite. We wanted to make sure people weren't saying the same thing, but then one person was choosing agree, one person was choosing disagree. So this helped us revise and remove questions. For example, the question or the item, neurodivergent people often see their neurodivergent traits as an important part of their personal identity. We felt like this was an important aspect of neurodiversity, but participants um, were commenting that this was very nuanced and maybe they knew people where this was super true, but then they maybe had a friend where this wasn't really true for them, so they weren't sure how to answer it. So that was telling us that even though this might be important, it's maybe not the best survey item, so we ended up removing that. And this process was repeated until all 29 items on the survey were understood and answerable by 80 to 90% of participants. And then we piloted the survey. So we're still piloting. Right now we have 283 people who have taken um, the survey. They include current helping professionals and UCSB undergrads who are planning to go into one of those fields. 24 identify as, sorry, 24% identify as neurodivergent and 12% identify as disabled. And then in terms of familiarity with neurodiversity, there was kind of a range from not at all, um, all the way up to extremely familiar. So we're gonna be then assessing a few things statistically. One thing is that we wanna see whether this questionnaire should be considered unidimensional or multidimensional. So unidimensional would be thinking about the, the overall survey as just looking at attitudes toward neurodiversity, or whether statistically it makes sense to think of it as multidimensional, meaning that it makes sense to break it up into affective, behavioral, and cognitive domains. 
We're also going to look to see whether the questions behave the way we would expect them to statistically. And then if they don't, we can review them and revise them as necessary. And then we want to see if the questions are evenly matched to our sample. We don't really want everybody to be disagreeing with every single question or agreeing with every single question because then there's no variation and the questions then lose meaning. We're also looking at participants' feedback as a whole. So for example, the item, I can see myself dating a neurodivergent person. Um, a, lot, a few people um, so far of what we've looked at have said that this might be irrelevant for asexual or aromantic individuals. So this, that might be telling us that this isn't a great survey item. Um, and so we may end up removing that. So our next step, so once we finish revisions and validating the survey, we want to then collect more data so that we can actually then characterize the attitudes toward neurodiversity amongst helping professionals. And ideally, such a questionnaire would be used to identify training needs amongst incoming employees, for example, first year teachers or incoming medical students or residents, so that we could see where maybe their attitudes toward neurodiversity um, could use some improvement. And then ultimately, um, we would like to redesign and revalidate a similar measure that can be used for pre and post testing. So giving it to a group, doing some sort of training on neurodiversity and then giving it to them again after to see any changes. Um, and we have to do this whole process again, um, but that's what we ultimately hope to do. So thank you so much um, for listening to my talk. I wanna also thank all of the participants who've participated in all phases of this uh, project. Happy to answer any questions. who is Holly Joseph from the University of Reading, who will be speaking to us today about identifying community priorities for dyslexia research. So welcome, Holly. Thank you, thank you very much. Hi everyone, it's great to see so many people here. So yes, I'm gonna be talking um, about identifying community priorities for dyslexia research. The um, principal investigator on this um, project is Kathy Manning, who you can see in bold, um, but she's on maternity leave at the moment, so that's why I'm here. So why identify community um, priorities? Well, because research is expensive, research can make a difference, it can be impactful, and it's necessarily specific. So in other words, if you're researching something, you're not researching something else. So it's really important that if we're doing research, for example, in the field of dyslexia, that that research has the potential to benefit the community that it's meant to serve. Um, and to do this effectively, um, it's really important that members of that community should be involved in the research process in terms of design and in terms of production of the research. So the idea of sort of doing research with a community rather than doing research um, to a community. And then if there is a discrepancy between what the research that we're doing and what people in that community think we should be doing, then we have a problem and we need to do something about it. So this... Um, project was based on a project um, from almost 10 years ago now, um, led by Liz Pelicano, who um, was interested in autism research. Um, so in this project, they looked at um, what autism research was being funded. And you can see in the pie chart there, you've got six different categories um, of the kinds of research within autism that was funded. And you can see that um, more than half of it was in the area of biology, brain, and cognition. So they looked at that, and then they asked autistic people what they thought about that. Do, were they happy with where that re research was, um, the funding was being targeted, or did they think it should be elsewhere? And they found that there was a clear disparity between what was being uh, funded and what people in the autistic community thought should be funded. So we thought, well, let's see if so we see something similar in dyslexia. Um, research. So that's where this project came from. Um, and there's three parts to this project which is ongoing. And the first um, was to collate and summarise information on what is being funded in dyslexia research. And the second was to run focus groups with um, uh, dyslexia community members in the UK to find out what they thought about this. So very similar to the autism project I've just talked about. Um, and then the third part, um, we haven't done yet, but I'll say a couple of words about that at the end. 
Okay, so first of all, what um, dyslexia is currently, dyslexia research is currently being funded in the UK. To do this, we basically went to various um, sources to find out what projects in the field of dyslexia have been funded between 1999 and now. Well, I mean, it, it was actually 2022 because we finished doing that last year. Um, and um, we then categorised all the projects within dyslexia research um, by topic in line with the autism Pelicano um, study. So we have those six same categories. Um, and then we, um, we counted the number of projects within each of those six categories, and we also worked out how much money there was in each of those um, categories. Um, on the right there, you've just got some examples of the kinds of funders that were funding dyslexia research. Okay, so here are the six categories. So um, the first one is diagnosis and characteristics. So that's obviously about diagnosis, screening tools, prevalence of dyslexia, characteristics, and things like that. The next one, biology, brain, and cognition. So you might remember that was the biggest category in the, in the autism study. And so this includes biological mechanisms, um, um, cognitive studies, so things like attention, um, language, um, learning, co-occurring conditions, sensory and motor function. So you can see there's quite a big category. The third category is causes. So there's lots of genetic studies in this category, but also things around family risk um, and environment. The fourth one is support and intervention. So most of those are educational interventions, um, obviously related to reading, but also other things like technology, um, apps, voice to text, software, etc. Um, the next one sort of broadens out a bit, services. So what services are available to people uh, with dyslexia, so community inclusion programmes, and also broadens out to um, um, somebody, uh, an individual's family, so family wellbeing, also practitioner training um, and service use and access. And finally, broadest of all is societal issues, so things around policy, um, social and ethical issues, lived experience, and also um, the economics of dyslexia. So those are the six categories. Um, so, <coughs> hmm, it's not working. Oh, there it is. Okay, so what we found was um, 45 projects funded on dyslexia between 1999 and 2022, and uh, just over 14 million pounds worth of funding. Um, and you can see there the categories, the number of projects, and the amount of money, and you probably don't need me to do this, to show you that the vast majority of those projects and the vast majority of the money, so 12.7 million pounds out of 14 million, is going on that one category, bio biology, brain, and cognition. So the next step was to ask people in the dyslexia community what they thought um, about this. Um, so to do this, we ran um, some focus groups. This is quite a small study at the moment. Um, so we had three focus uh, groups with um, adults with dyslexia, and then we had four focus groups with parents and carers of children um, with dyslexia. And... Um, we recruited them from many different, so through many different um, channels based on some of Cathy's existing links, social media, different dyslexia charities, including Helen Arkell, and because we really wanted to um, have um, um, a group of participants who were representative of the dyslexia <coughs> community. Well, as you can see, we did not, uh, <laughs> we were not successful in achieving this. So um, the vast majority of our participants were women, 86%. Um, uh, they were highly educated, so that's defined by having an undergraduate or a higher degree, so 82%, and the vast majority were also white. So this is something to bear in mind when, you know, um, thinking about what we found. Okay, so the focus groups were online, and the ones with the dyslexic adults were led by a dyslexic adult, and the ones with parents of dyslexic children were led by the parent of a dyslexic child. And there were two parts to the focus groups. The first part um, I'm not going to talk about today. That was more kind of narrative about people's experiences, um, the challenges they faced, um, their feelings. And then in the middle of the focus group, we showed them the data that I've just shown you about funding. Um, and we asked them, what, what do you think about this? Do you think that's right? Would you like to see uh, research funding targeted elsewhere? Okay, so first of all, in terms of their views on the current funding, they were pretty unanimous in saying, no, we don't think that's right for so much of it to be on sort of the brain and biology. These are just two quotes here sort of, you know, showing that. So the first one, very little focus on the individual. Um, um, 
and the, and the impact it has on their lives. So, you know, instead of thinking about the brain, thinking about the person as a whole, um, and the other one sort of saying, I'm just not that interested, I'm not bothered where, where, you know, how my brain might be different or how my child's brain might be different. You know, I want to know, you know, what's going to help, what's going to support me or my child. And then for the second part, um, so this, um, so I don't, I am not a qualitative researcher, um, so we got some help with uh, um, analysing um, um, the data from Karen McClellan, who may be here somewhere, um, who did a thematic analysis, and she um, sort of um, found four main themes in terms of what people thought dyslexia research should focus on. So the first one um, is on identification and diagnosis of dyslexia, so making it easy, accessible, um, and effective, and interpretable. So we can kind of put that in the diagnosis and characteristics group. The second one's about educational and occupational support, so lots about how teachers aren't really equipped to, to um, um, support children with dyslexia because they don't know enough about it and also about um, transition to employment. Um, so that would come under support and interventions. The third one was about um, improving societal understanding and attitudes towards people with dyslexia, um, understanding about co-occurring conditions, recognising strengths as well as challenges, and sort of misunderstanding and stigma of dyslexia, tackling that. So I put that under societal issues. And the final one was about improving mental health and self-esteem of dyslexic people. Um, so sort of forming positive self-identity, understanding the impact of, you know, uh, of dyslexia, camouflaging, exhaustion, compensating, all those kinds of issues. So I kind of put those um, within, you know, services and support because I think it could go under either. So to conclude... Um, there is, it seems, a disparity between the research we're funding and what um, people with dyslexia think should be funded. So what's being funded is sort of basic cognitive and biological research. What people have said they would like to be funded is about improving diagnosis, improving support, and improving or increasing understanding of dyslexia. The next step is to um, run a survey and um, to send out to a much wider group of people with uh, dyslexia and perhaps people who self-identify as having dyslexia due to issues around how you get um, a, a diagnosis. And then we'll apply for funding to research one of these um, priorities. So watch this space. Thank you very much. Next, we are welcoming Catherine Asbury from the University of York with some work on what parents of nonverbal and minimally verbal autistic children think about genomic studies of autism. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. Hi. Um, very nice to be here. I'm Catherine Asbury. Um, I'm not normally a conference person, but ITACOM sounded so fantastic I had to come. So thank you for organizing and thank you for coming along to this session. So, what do parents of nonverbal and minimally verbal autistic children think and feel about genomic studies of autism? Quite a controversial question. Um, get my button going. So, one thing to ask is who cares? Why do, we, why do we open this Pandora's box? Why do we ask the question in the first place? Well, I would start by saying I care. Um, my background is in behavioral genetics and genomics, and I spend quite a lot of my time making a case that maybe there's something useful here that could help in education and could help um, reduce inequalities. So it seems like interesting and important research to me. I'm also very aware of the debates that Holly's just talked to us about in terms of what do autistic people think about the research we should be doing and where we should be spending research funding. I'm also the parent to a minimally verbal autistic child, so I care for lots of reasons. And looking at Twitter and the academic literature, I get the feeling I'm not on my own in caring, although people come at it with a lot of very different perspectives. But this was all thrown into sharp relief in summer 2021 when the Spectrum 10K study was launched. And for me, it was a fascinating series of events to, um, to watch unfold. So Spectrum 10K got a large grant from the Wellcome Trust to, as we say here, investigate the genetic and environmental factors that contribute to autism and related physical and mental health conditions to better understand well-being in autistic people and their families. So on the face of it, as someone who works in behavioral genetic research, looks all right, might be useful, looks interesting. 
look a bit closer and there's some worries around how it's being communicated, around the ethics, but the fundamental research question struck me as a reasonable and potentially useful research question. And so then it was fascinating to see this grassroots movement spring up and we saw the Boycott Spectrum 10K um, movement spring up and see what struck me as very genuine fear at points, existential concerns. There's a nice pa paper by Heidi Natri where it's very clear that there's a worry that the researchers are not being honest and that there's another agenda here that people are not being explicit about and that maybe what we're looking at is some kind of backdoor to prenatal screening. And when you start to think of it like that rather than this is just the kind of research project we see in genetics all the time, you start to see it as an existential threat and you start to understand why people are reacting so very strongly to it. And not just strongly, but really effectively. I mean, it paused the Spectrum 10K study. Um, Spectrum, the team have been asked to do a full and proper consultation with the autistic and autism communities. And it hasn't started again yet. And it's been quite a long time now. So this was very effective. But um, thinking about what was going on, and also thinking about Robert Chapman's talk this morning, which some of you may have been at, I was interested in the democracy of it all and who was being heard and who made up the Boycott Spectrum 10K campaign and did they represent all of the autism community or all of the autistic community. So I was interested in who was heard and who was not in the reaction to that particular project, which is just kind of a touch paper for a much broader issue, I think, really. So we set up the personal experiences of autism and perceptions of DNA-based research projects. That D is doing some very heavy lifting, but we couldn't <laughs> just couldn't resist the peapod analogy. It was there and had to be taken. Um, we were interested in hearing from the autistic community, so autistic individuals themselves, but also the broader autism community. And we wanted to map what people throughout these two communities think about genomic studies of autism to try to get a proper understanding of, is this something we should be doing at all? If so, how should it be done? What are the questions that would be valued? We needed somewhere to start, and so we started with two groups. One was a study of late diagnosed autistic adults, and that's led by Becky Ellis, who'll be presenting a poster on this at four o'clock this afternoon and a study of parents of nonverbal and minimally verbal autistic children, was, which was partly just driven by my interest as a parent of a minimally verbal autistic child. Just a case of starting somewhere. There's a lot of mapping still to be done. So the study involved interviews with 20 parents, as is very common across psychological research. 19 of them were mothers. Um, they were parents of nonverbal or minimally verbal autistic children in primary school in England. We got seven girls and 14 boys, and I do know that that adds up to 21, but one parent had two autistic children who met our criteria. We didn't ask about learning difficulties or school type, but it, as it turned out, 15 out of 10, 20 of the children attended a special school or a specialist unit attached to a mainstream school. And of the parents, um, three were diagnosed as autistic, Eight saw themselves as neurodivergent in some way, but for a variety of reasons hadn't sought diagnosis. Seven identified as neurotypical, and two didn't respond. And we weren't able to probe because actually we anticipated that some of our parents would be autistic and neurodivergent in other ways, and so we offered a choice of data collection methods. The two that didn't respond gave audio recorded responses or written responses, so we didn't have the opportunity to probe. But you can see some people were interviewed online, some had telephone interviews, some people gave their data in writing, and that worked really well, and I think people liked it. Again, Becky's done some work on people's responses to providing data in this choice-driven way, and it seems to be largely very positive. Um, we analyzed the transcripts of our data with reflexive thematic analysis, and the study was co-produced with two autistic experts by experience and overseen by a team that included three autistic adults and, and, and me. Um, so, what we wanted to know, our research questions were, how do parents feel about their nonverbal or minimally verbal autistic children participating in, autistic, uh, in genomic studies of autism? Would they say yes? Would they give their consent? And how do they feel about the development of polygenic scores to predict autism? 
I only have three minutes, so I won't stop and explain polygenic scores, but I can do so to anybody over coffee. Um, we identified five themes in the data. Um, one, these parents like autism research. They're very keen for the research to be happening, but they have some caveats about what autism research is useful. It's driven by curiosity, interest. They want to know more. I just think the more information you can find out, the better. I don't think there are any downsides. But it was very clear in the data that genomic studies of autism should not be working towards eradication or cure. So this that we'd seen in the Natri paper was very clear in this sample as well. It, they're happy with basic science. It doesn't have to be applied research, but it should be designed to enhance knowledge or understanding or to optimise support for autistic children and adults. Um, and there was a particular interest in there, which I think is relevant to this, this particular group, to break autism down a little bit and to look at the bits that are, they, these parents perceived as causing their children problems. So they were interested in genomic studies of sensory challenges and of speech and communication, rather than big studies of autism as a, as a whole homogenous thing, which I don't think it is. Um, okay. Theme two, we care about the means as well as the ends. So there were logistical concerns. These parents had had very, these children had had very traumatic experience with giving blood and things like that. So reassurance around what's actually involved in sharing DNA seemed to be quite important. And also research ethics and transparent communication are paramount. And we really saw this in the reaction to Spectrum 10K. They want to know who's doing the research and who's funding it and what motivations are lying behind it. And then this second one I think is really interesting and it's a real challenge for an age of big data. Um, these parents, would, if they consented to their child taking part in a genomic study of autism, would only want the DNA to be used for that study, not kept in a biobank, not used for lots of other studies. There are logistical difficulties with that. It doesn't fit with the current direction of research, but it's something, but it seems to me it's a very reasonable request. That's something that, that needs to be looked at and a way forward found. Now, some people, but not all, felt that using a polygenic score for autism, so predicting the likelihood of a child being autistic, um, so this wouldn't be a diagnosis, it's just a probability, um, would make life better because you would know more. And some people felt that knowledge is power, so it wouldn't have changed her outcome, but it may have made us less stressed and more patient. And that in itself can only have had a positive impact on her, can't it? Um, some felt that it would change their lives by triggering early support. There's some evidence from genetic screening for other conditions that, that that isn't necessarily what would happen in the real world, but there was a belief that maybe it would, and in that sense it would be helpful, um, and it would improve parenting and reduce parental anxiety. While others felt it would be pointless, it would make little difference, could make some things worse, because we don't have the interventions anyway, so what will we do with the information? UK services are shoddy. People had had very difficult um, experiences, so it wouldn't help on that front. And there was a lack of faith in the system. But then I think this final theme is interesting as well. Our children's voices are not heard in discussions about autism research. So these parents didn't feel represented by the Boycott Spectrum 10K campaign. And they felt that their children and them as their voices were too rarely included. So I've got a slide with some conclusions that you can um, look at later. But other than that, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions later. Thank you. So we're welcoming our final speaker now, who is Patrick Dwyer, joining us from UC Davis. Um, so speaking about the neurodiversity movement and its implications for intervention. So thank you, Patrick. As soon as Patrick finishes, we're going to welcome all our speakers back to the stage for some Q&A. Yeah, thanks so much. So I'm an autistic PhD candidate, part of a group of autistic and non-autistic researchers interested in this topic um, because the neurodiversity movement, um, you know, it's so complex. There's a lot of misunderstandings, a lot of confusion about what it actually is, and that means that a lot of these important debates about it are seeming to happen across purposes. People don't necessarily agree on what it is that there is that they are debating. Like, for example. Um, some people um, think of the neurodiversity movement as saying that we're endorsing 
um, what we might call a strong social model of disability that society causes all disability related challenges. Whereas, you know, other people, we heard this very clearly from Sven Bolte earlier today in the keynote. Um, some people would say actually the neurodiversity movement um, is looking at both, you know, the person and society around them and their interaction or fit, um, much more nuanced view. So unfortunately, it's very difficult to resolve this sort of confusion because there is no sort of clear leader you can point to as like, oh, this is what neurodiversity is. So we surveyed uh, a large group of people um, from the autism community because that's where so much of the debate has been happening. Um, uh, that's including um, autistic people, some of whom have other roles as well, being you know parents or researchers, for example, as well as non-autistic uh, family members of autistic people, non-autistic researchers, professionals, educators, many people having multiple hats, 500 people in total surveyed online through social media, reaching out to organizations, asking them to distribute information, etc. And uh, we asked if people had heard of neurodiversity, pretty much everybody had, and then we asked um, if they supported the neurodiversity movement, and you know there was quite a bit um, more support um, than opposition. Um, slightly more support among the autistic people you see in gold there than the non-autistic people you see in blue there, but not a huge difference. We asked about the social model of disability. Most of the autistic people had heard of this. About half of the non-autistic people had. Of those who had heard of it, most supported it. But what are they supporting? So we also asked them to define the neurodiversity movement and the social model and talk about differences and similarities between them. We did content analysis on those data and you know, briefly, because um, I don't have a huge amount of time, a selection of some of the things that came up. Uh, most um, people defining the social model were um, adopting what we might call the strong social model, this idea that it is society alone that causes disability. However, there were also a pretty decent number of people who were giving you know, more nuanced answers. They were talking about you know, maybe the person environment match or saying that you know, the social model is saying that society causes a lot of challenges or problems, but not necessarily all. We also asked again about those uh, differences and similarities and you know, a selection of similarities of which many were identified included you know, shared goals like inclusion, acceptance, accessibility, um, both sharing you know, uh, neutral or positive views of disability as opposed to negative ones. Um, a lot of people were explicitly saying that both the neurodiversity movement and the social model of disability are endorsing this sort of strong social model position that um, disability um, is caused by society. Um, and some people were explicitly saying that the neurodiversity movement uses or comes out of the social model of disability. Fewer reports here of differences. There were some people who were saying that the social model is broader, inclusive of more disabilities, but also interestingly, some people who were saying that maybe the social model is less nuanced than the neurodiversity movement in its view of disability, like maybe the social model is taking this strong social model, it's all society position, whereas maybe the neurodiversity diversity movement is taking this more person environment fit type position, for example. But we also asked about more sort of concrete questions about intervention goals, which were sorted into various factors, including normalization goals, such as promoting eye contact. Um, these sorts of normalization goals were strongly opposed by the autistic people in gold there. And even the non-autistic people seemed more opposed than supportive, though it is interesting to see that although I showed you earlier that neurodiversity support levels were quite similar between the autistic and non-autistic people, only a small difference, here that difference is suddenly much bigger, which I find interesting. But in both groups, um, people who support the neurodiversity movement are more opposed to normalization, as you'd expect. We also asked about societal reform, things like educating non-autistic people. Everybody seemed to support this, which was nice to see, and neurodiversity movement supporters were especially enthusiastic about it. We also asked about well-being type goals, like improving quality of life, mental health. Um, again, pretty much everybody seemed supportive of this. Slightly more skepticism among the autistic people, but based on some, like, is there anything else you want to say type comments, it seemed like this was more about skepticism of how the goal would be pursued rather than the goal itself. Um, 
Everybody supported this, though, regardless of neurodiversity support. There is no correlation between neurodiversity support and support for this goal. And I think the most interesting goal um, is about adaptive skills type interventions. So this is an interesting one. It's not exactly normalization, um, but it is about changing the person in some way. Um, so in the factor analysis, you're seeing items here that are changing the person, but not to the same extent as normalization. So it building interpersonal skills um, for example, there were um, probably mostly items that landed here were about something to do with interpersonal skills or conversational skills and stuff like that. Um, not all, there were others like independence and so on. Um, and um, you know, these were not opposed necessarily. People were open to these. Um, autistic people, you know, slightly supportive to supportive, non-autistic people supportive to strongly supportive. And neurodiversity movement supporters were a bit more skeptical, but still open to this kind of intervention. And we asked, uh, we looked explicitly at whether these strong social model supporters, the people who think the social model of disability is about society alone causing disability, and they support that, um, they too were open to this kind of intervention. So they are saying that society causes all issues, yet they are open to here interventions that are focusing on changing the individual in some way, which is really interesting. There's also the question of, you know, other conditions sort of going beyond autism. And again, I don't have a huge amount of time, but, you know, one example of that, we asked about anxiety. And you can see here, there's a wide range of views on whether curing anxiety is a good thing or not. People very split on that question, but most people supporting, teaching, useful coping and problem solving skills to people with anxiety. Most people also supporting societal reform, changing the world, making it a better, more supportive place for people with anxiety. Anxiety. Almost nobody is saying that we don't need to do anything about anxiety because it's not a problem. We included that with the expectation nobody would agree with it and pretty much nobody did. We can also look and see again those strong social model supporters, specifically those people who think that society is causing all disability, they too are showing these more nuanced positions, including some of them an openness to curing anxiety. And that support for cure gets much um, stronger when we get to epilepsy. Some of you may have been in Robert Chapman's talk earlier um, about you know, the pathology and how neurodiversity movement supporters are still seeing some role for, for curing some of these genuinely medical conditions for medical treatment for them. That's very consistent with our data, people very much supporting a cure for epilepsy. Less um, support for um, teaching useful coping and problem solving skills for epilepsy than there was for anxiety. But interestingly, people are still very much on board with societal reform to make the world more supportive for people with epilepsy. So they are not seeing a contradiction between pursuing cure and pursuing societal reform. They are interested in both. And this is true as well among our... Um, I Where's the, oh, there we go. Um, among the strong social model supporters, um, they also are open to curing epilepsy despite this stated belief that society is the root of all disability. So overall, you know, what can we conclude um, from all of this, participants have very nuanced opinions. You know, are, are samples broadly supportive of neurodiversity, broadly opposed to normalization of autistic behaviors? Our participants seemed very interested, all of them, in societal reform and promoting well being, um, or almost all of them. Um, and, you know, the views are very nuanced because even though some participants are appearing to say that, you know, society is responsible for everything, they are still showing this openness to changing individuals through teaching adaptive skills and coping skills and things and curing some of these more medical type conditions. So. I think it's really important, therefore, that we're always investing the time in understanding other people's perspectives because it's very easy if you are going into things with the idea that you disagree with somebody to just go online, look at Twitter, take the most radical thing you can find and set it up as a straw man, and then you've validated your initial opinion that those other people are wrong and you are right. But if you really take the effort to develop that deep knowledge, like insider-type knowledge of other people's 
people's views, then you know it's going to be much easier to find agreement and points of common ground. And to Sven Bolte's point earlier, um, we will be much more effective um, in advocating if we are united and can take our message to those outside of our movement um, rather than spending all of our time disputing amongst ourselves. Thank you all. Okay. And uh, uh, yes, I should, and thank you as well to that wonderful, brilliant team of autistic and non-autistic researchers I mentioned before. You can see them right there. Thank you, Patrick, for that jolt of energy and also a call to arms. Um, we're gonna welcome all our speakers back now. Once again, we had Rachel, Holly, Catherine, and Patrick, who we just heard. I know we won't be able to get through all the questions. This will be quick fire. We may also run just a couple of minutes over if you need to leave, please do so. I'm going to go ahead and start with a question for Rachel. Lots of interest in accessing your questionnaire, so people want to know how and when can they access it, and also to what extent might it need to be adjusted to be relevant to a UK context? Um, so that's a good question in terms of access. I, we are still currently piloting it, so we want to take all of that pilot data and continue revising it. Of course, I think something like this could be revised forever. Um, so we don't want to revise it forever. Um, so I'm, we're hoping that um, once we analyze this current round, that then we'll have something that's at least uh, publishable or ready to be um, used and hopefully um, relevant to a wide audience. Um, so. When that is, I don't know exactly, you know, hoping within the next uh, year or so. Um, but in the, in the meantime, we're happy to share what we have and um, get, get even more feedback on it. Um, and then in terms of being relevant to a UK audience, um, it's, I would say that the, the items as they are right now are not necessarily very specific to the US um, because we, we designed the items not to be specific to, as I said, like teachers, uh, which could be more specific, but they're very broad about the neurodiversity paradigm in general. And we've used literature, um, both academic um, and um, advocates, you know, online, all of those perspectives to design the questionnaire items. So I think that they should be relevant um, to a wide audience. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Um, now we have a question coming up for Holly, and we've had several questions that were related along the lines of saying, well, does more biological or brain-based or cognitive research, do we need to do that research first in order to sort of develop appropriate interventions and services? And they wanted to know what you thought about that question. Oh, that's really interesting because I had that discussion every, I was, I was one of the focus group leaders and I had that discussion every focus group that I led because, of course, you don't know what the right support is if you don't have the evidence for you know, what works. And so by understanding the biological and cognitive basis of dyslexia, then we're in a better position to um, think about what works best. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I do think that that kind of research is very important, and indeed it's what I do. Um, but I, I think it's really important as well to listen to, you know, the people in the dyslexia community who are not who do not feel that they the research being done is research that will benefit them. And they, you know, I think they have a very good point. I think it's also true that the kind of research that's being done could have a benefit for the dyslexia community, but that isn't being um, communicated uh, well. So I think that's sort of another issue is about communication. Thank you very much, Holly. Um, a question for Catherine next. We've had some very different types of questions. So we'll start with one about co-production, actually. People asking for a bit more information and examples. And also, how did you reflect those concerns and the ideas in the rest of the research project? Yeah, co-production was very much at the heart of the Peapod study. And in the early day, from, from before we developed it and applied for ethical approval. Um, I was working closely with an autistic expert by experience who was fantastically helpful actually and showed me how we need to revise all our ethics applications. Um, so I, I think for this particular project, co-production has been at the heart of it. We have worked with autistic people all the way through and with parents of autistic children. And in a way, it was designed as a pilot study that could act as a piece of co-production in itself for thinking about how we're going to move forward and co-produce genomic autism studies in a way that 
is deemed acceptable and useful. And we have shared our findings with the Spectrum 10K team, and we've shared them with the Psychiatric Gen Genetics Consortium as well, in the hope that those voices can feed in to the plans that people are making. Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I'm now going to ask Patrick a question, and then we'll jump back and forth a little bit more. Um, once you got to the end of your study, I know all of us running a study, we get to the end and go, I wish I'd asked, mm -hmm. was there something else you really wished you had more data about or you think is a good place to follow up next? So, first of all, you know, we're not quite done yet. It's um, sort of a, a never-ending project. We still have some uh, data about the medical model, qualitative data there that we are still coding. Um, it's 500 responses, um, and, you know, to each of these open-ended questions. It's a lot of work. Um, Second, um, yeah, there's also some parts of the study that I didn't have time to show you here. Like we have a bunch of things about intellectual disability and high support need that I did not have time in the 10 minute talk to say. And I think those data are really important. Um, Lynette um, Hirsch, an honor student, did a lot of work on that um, in particular and uh, keep an eye out for them. Um, but I, I think, you know, if I were to sort of go like, okay, where, where do we go next from here? Um, I think, you know, one big question is what about the people with high support needs um, themselves? What do they think? Because this online survey modality was not very accessible for them. So we know people who are, are close to them and what they think, but not what people themselves in that group think. And I think that's a major gap. Thank you very much, Patrick. Now we've got a question for everyone about sort of translation or transferability, because while you've talked to quite different groups, they also had a certain amount of similarities in some respect. So someone's asked, how can your outcomes translate to non-weird public, uh, I'm mixing my words, non-weird populations, and do you think your findings would generalize to other groups? Who'd like to start us off? Well, um, I can say right off the bat that our sample was pretty, pretty weird. Um, I think we were something like 80% non-Hispanic white. And um, Lynette, who I just mentioned, did some of the high support needs stuff, um, has also had sort of a preliminary look at that. And um, seeing, you know, a bit more um, skepticism, if I'm recalling correctly, um, I should have looked this up beforehand, it was a while ago, um, uh, you know, in some of these um, uh, more um, ethnically or, or racially, racially marginalized um, communities, more skepticism about um, neurodiversity, for example. So, um, yeah, this, this is another thing that um, should be looked into further to the last question that you asked me. Um, in follow-up um, to the work that we did just now, so, yeah. I think this is a huge issue in dyslexia research because, as I'm sure many of you know, most children who get a dyslexia diagnosis, their parents have paid for it. And so the people that would come into the focus groups that I met were parents who were very highly educated. Many of the children were at private school um, because their parents had been able to pay for it. And so the group I'm really interested in are people who've gone through the school system who haven't had a diagnosis and have been maybe sort of labelled informally as, you know, not bright or, you know, just poor at reading or low expectations, etc. And those are, who was talking about the um, criminal justice system? You know, somebody, oh, uh, Rory Bremner was talking about how 25% of people in the criminal justice system have ADHD, while about 60 or 70% have literacy difficulties. And so those are the people I think we really, really want to, you know, support and talk to and hear from, but it's really hard. So we have to work harder um, to do it. Thank you, Holly. I'm actually going to ask Laura if she wants to add anything, and then we've got another question for Catherine. Did you want to add anything? Oh, sorry, Laura. Rachel, oh my goodness. We're <laughs> no just worries. having one of those days, aren't we? No problem. Um, yeah, I did want to just add that I agree. I think more work needs to be done in our particular project. Um, the sample is also mostly white, although the undergrad um, population at UC Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara is designated as a Hispanic serving institution. So there are, um, there is a good chunk of participants from that portion of our participants who do identify as Hispanic, um, which is great to have that um, population, although other um, 
ethnic or racial minorities are not as um, represented in our sample. And also, because a lot of our participants are also um, undergraduates, there's a lot of issues with using you know, that population um, just because they're, they're kind of an unusual group of people. Um, so I think continuing to pilot with other groups as well uh, will be really important for our project. Thank you. I'm one, gonna, one more thing. I'm going to ask I you to hold on. I was correct earlier. Oh, just you were. So you know, it, it, is, it is indeed greater skepticism in some of these uh, marginalized communities. There's some interesting TikTok videos by Kayla Smith and, and others that we think might have something to do with why that is. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Patrick. So we're going to take a last question from Catherine. I would encourage you, though, to please continue these conversations online and in person because there were so many good questions that we didn't get to. Thank you all so much. So wrapping up with the last question for Catherine is we know that a lot of people have concerns about genetic use data or might want it used only for very specific studies. At the same time, we're pushing toward open science mm -hmm. and the power of big data. Do you have any thoughts about what we can feasibly do to kind of balance these two concerns? Yeah, I think big data research is really valuable, really important for understanding what's going on at, at the big picture level. I think the open science agenda is hugely important and is making my own discipline of psychology much, much better. So these are valuable things. But the request I hear from these participants and other autistic people to only have their data used for a particular study feels extremely reasonable. So I think to me, the only way forward is the manual, laborious way of if somebody gives consent for their data to be kept, their DNA. Uh, the ideal, I guess, from a, a scientist's point of view, would be for the DNA to be kept, but for the individual to be contacted for consent for every follow-up analysis or study. It's laborious. People like to work fast. People, it, we, we work in an age of fast publication. People want to move quickly. But it seems to me such a reasonable request about a type of data that is more personal than any other type of data that we collect that we absolutely have to accommodate it from my point of view. Thank you so much again to all of our speakers. Once again, Rachel Schuck, Holly Joseph, Catherine Asbury, and Patrick Dwyer. Let's give them a big flap, yes. Thank you so much. Coming up next, we have a keynote lecture in the Pentland Room starting in just a few minutes. Thank you again.